Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Docs Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events and today is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, check it out. You'll see all the events we have in our pipeline. If you have not subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, now it's the best time to do that. So if you subscribe, you will get notified about all future streams like the one we have today. And we have an amazing Slack community where you can hang out with other data enthusiasts. During today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a pinned link in the live chat. So click on that, ask your question, and we will be covering these questions during the interview. I'll stop sharing right now. And I don't know where my mobile is. Usually I also open the stream on my mobile phone to track uh, questions there, but it's gone. So. I'll try to make do without it. Okay, so now I'm opening the questions we prepared for you. And if you're ready, we can start. Let's start. This week we'll talk about AI for ecology, biodiversity, and conservation. And we have a special guest today, Tanya. Tanya is a computational ecologist with research at the unique intersection of computer science, wildlife, biology, and social sciences, and social sciences. And this is what we will be talking today. So welcome to our interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And as usual, the questions for today's interview are prepared by Johanna Bayer. Thanks, Johanna, for your help. And let's start. So before we go into our main topic of AI for ecology, biodiversity and conservation. Let's start with your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Yeah, so currently I am professor of computer science and engineering, electrical computer engineering and evolution ecology and organismal biology at the Ohio State University in the state of Ohio in the United States. Uh, I'm also director of the Translational Data Analytics Institute there. That's the largest interdisciplinary research institute at OSU. And OSU is a very large university. Um, and that is a community, research community within the university that unites anybody who in some way generates, uses, analyzes, represents, is curious by, enabled by, um, adjacent to data in their research scholarship and creative expressions. And that these days, that's pretty much everybody. So we have people from arts and humanities to statistics and computer science. My own research and my own focus is on AI for ecology, environment, biodiversity, and conservation. And um, that journey in research started with my PhD at the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign, which I got in 2002, a while ago. Uh, and after a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral uh, training at the University of New Mexico in computational uh, phylogeny, that's evolutionary biology. And then uh, in computational ecology in Princeton, I started as a faculty at the University of Illinois Chicago in 2005 and came to the Ohio State University in 2020, right before the pandemic, January 2020 was great timing. So I've been here ever since. Um, and, in, and along the way, uh, in my journey, I did my PhD in very theoretical computer science, so that had nothing to do with ecology, but uh, I um, did have jobs in ecology departments and worked with ecologists and married to one. So I've walked away from many conversations with ecologists that there are better ways, there are gotta be better ways of answering questions that they were asking um, other than what was typical at the time is creating systems of partial differential equations, describing um, different aspects of the system with having more parameters than uh, than like birds or or animals um, that we wanted uh, in the population that we wanted to characterize. And so um, I also studied uh, it's called computational ecology or biology, where you model population of fish or like uh, yeah. there's also these models like predator prey right yeah, yeah. a lot of a ton of differential equations 
And like actually when I was uh, studying, like I was studying computer science and I was thinking like, oh, why do I need all that? Yeah, so I was thinking the same thing, especially when when uh, working on uh, data sets. I, I remember one was uh, working for the Army Corps of Engineers because the thing is in the US, the, Ar uh, the Army bases are often the last big habitats, untouched actually habitats of uh, many rare and endangered species. And so they're required by law to do impact assessment on their activities on these endangered species. This is the Endangered Species Act that just celebrated its 50th anniversary in the United States in December. So if they want to do a, an exercise, a military exercise, or put a road through the uh, military base, they need to figure out what's the impact going to be on the endangered species. And so I spent a lot of time modeling the impact of like 30 birds population with like 100 parameter systems. And I was like, no, this has got to be a better way. So after my PhD, I did start developing the whole area, what it would be look, what it would look like, what are the algorithmic approaches that are not necessarily the dynamic systems. And uh, in the process realized that we need methods like machine learning, computer vision methods for even basic analysis of data because Images are by far the largest and most abundant source of information about data, um, about anything in the world, including including wildlife. And so that's where in 2011, uh, we got the first, almost by accident, uh, the first program for identifying individual zebras from photographs um, with just two clicks. And that was, um, part of my collaboration with behavioral ecologists. So I started out uh, with a college, uh, working with ecologists who study behavior of animals, particularly social behavior, um, and more specifically zebras, which is why zebras in my background here. Uh, so Dan Rubenstein, uh, professor at Princeton University in the U.S. in New Jersey, uh, the premier. Uh, a researcher who studies equids, so zebras, horses, donkeys. And they were studying social behavior. And I was like, wait, how do you know who is whose zebra friend? Like, well, we have a field assistant who, who goes out in the field, you know, looks on a closed loop in this nature preserve in Kenya every time she sees zebras. Um, she stops, she takes GPS, she tries to make very, very, very careful pictures. Uh, take tip of every zebra that she sees with making sure they're facing right with like the the uh, whole side visible and she keeps the best picture and then she brings them to the back to the lab and then starts clicking on the outline of the zebra and I was watching her do that and I'm like I'm an impatient engineer right mm -hmm. so two minutes into it I'm like how long is it going to take they're like wait Five minutes later, I'm like, this is taking forever. How long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait. 20 minutes later, after clicking on the outline, because what happened is that they would click very, very, very carefully on the outline, and there was a program that would fit a 3D model and then match pixel for pixel uh, of the, the, the lines of the zebras, which is also very inaccurate. I'm like, oh, my God, this is insane. This is taking forever. And... They're like, oh, if you're so impatient, you know, do you think you can do better? I'm like, you want to bet? It should take two clicks. Mm -hmm. So after that, of course, I go to my then PhD student, Mike Lahiri, and I'm, I just, that's my reputation that we can identify individual zebras from photographs in two clicks. Mm -hmm. But I also have an idea of how to do it. So we did. And it was okay. Um, and then, uh, but it got a lot of publicity because, you know, walking barcodes kind of analogy, even though it's not accurate, but that's, you know, really identifying individual zebras to photographs, great. So a proper computer vision researcher, Chuck Stewart at Translator Polytechnic Institute heard about it and was, uh, and approached me at a conference saying, great, you can identify individual zebras from photographs. Uh, but we can do better. I'm like, fantastic, let's do it. And so we did. 
and that's when in 2013 we published this um, paper with on uh, properly identifying individual animals from photographs, anything striped. Uh, the spotted, wrinkled, notched, so that's expanded the number of species, proper computer vision approach. Um, in some obscure, we published it in some obscure computer vision conference, and then two months later, we had, we were, we thought we were done, but then, because we published, right? This is how research works. But two months later, we had requests from about 70, 70 uh, researchers all over the play, all over the world, asking, can you do my species? Can you do my species? Everything from like tiny Hawaiian snails, beautiful ones, look them up, to whale sharks and uh, uh, tigers, everything. I'm like, oh my God, this is actually useful for conservation. So we started a nonprofit, Wild Me, that creates AI solutions for conservation and is home of the platform Wildbook, which um, is using this individual ID to really organize observations about animals and then uh, to continue research in this recently, funded by the US National Science Foundation, we've founded a whole new field of science called Imageomics, the omics of images. And we'll practice pronouncing that. Um, Imageomics. The, Imageomics, the omics of images. So it's image omics, right? Imageomics. Like economics. No, like genomics, like proteomics, metabolomics. So uh, Meta <laughs> protein omics, right? So proteomics. <laughs> Uh, gene omics. There are so many yeah. more omics than I could ever imagine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can talk a little bit about that. But, uh, and then AI and Biodiversity Change Global Climate Center, also recently funded by the US National Science Foundation and the Canada's uh, National Science Engineering Research Council, is a new center to understand the impact of climate change on AI. Uh, on biodiversity using AI. So with that, this is kind of most of the icons that are in my background and like very brief summary of my journey. <laughs> and funny that you mentioned that, um, like you said, you are married to, if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly, you're married to, was it ecologist? Ecologist, uh, yeah. Ecologist. And then you also observe how people do this in this field. And for you, a computer scientist, that was like, seriously? that takes so much time. And this is also, my mother is also, she's um, an ecologist. And like I noticed, like I think it was 10 years ago when I was helping here with some calculations that the methods that are used that are super common place in uh, like data science in industry are only, only getting attention in ecology, right? And things like, I don't know, time series analysis, like uh, all this machine learning, uh, classification, regression, they are not really that widespread. And you could publish a paper by just taking a data set with some climate data and then off the shelf model from scikit-learn, fitting it and then publishing the paper. And to me, it was like very interesting um, observation because like I had no idea that uh, you know, I thought it's normal because like I'm a data scientist, I see this happening every day at work, right? And I guess this is, uh, this was also kind of your experience, right? That you saw that there is so much to be automated in this area. So it's more than automated, um, you know, biodiversity and conservation. So I would separate a little bit the climate science, environments and science and biodiversity and conservation. Climate science, I think, gets a lot of attention and reasonable amount of resources recently. So there are amazing climate models and they're constantly improving and there's an insane amount of data that's there, uh, particularly through remote sensing. And so things like agencies, like um, all the space agencies that observe led by NASA, the US space agency, and, uh, well, National Atmospheric, uh, and space agency, and then um, not not atmospheric. I combined the two agencies together. Apologies to NASA, um, because uh, the the not, uh, the NOAA and NASA, sorry, uh, the two uh, 
agencies that collect remote sensing data in the US, but then also space agencies and equivalent agencies throughout the world. So there's a lot of data about climate and climate change and also environmental um, data. But for biodiversity and conservation, the data is very, the data situation is very, very different. In fact, we actually do not have good data in this, in this area. You gave an example, like there was only 30 birds of a certain species, right? And like, how could you model this with standard? For population, yeah. Uh, yeah. But the biodiversity, so right. biodiversity, huh? That's related, right? Because I'm yes. not really knowledgeable in all these areas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, not only populations are not observed often enough. So we have this that the, the whole journey there started with like you have we have thirty birds in a particular area. That's the population of these birds. There are other populations, and so when they try to model these population dynamics, where you need birth rate, death rate, dispersal rates you know, uh, mating rates, all, all of these kinds of things, uh, successful mating, the, the parameters that they would take are, okay, so this is the population uh, in Florida, but we have this birth rate from a similar species in Texas. Great, we'll use that. We have a death rate from this species, but from 50 years ago, you know, so it's, it's all over the place. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We don't even have the basic data. We say that uh, right now, the recent reports are saying that a million species are threatened with extinction. And by the way, million, to put this in context, there is total estimated only about 10 million species of plants, fungi, and animals out there. That includes all bugs, all the beetles, insects, everything. That's a shockingly low number, right? So only 10 million species. People think there are billions. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought too. Well, I, billions, yeah. I thought- No, that only 10 million, which means a million? When One million, like 10% is- uh, Threatened with extinction, yeah. So that's, that's the shocking number, right? And so, but the thing is, these are estimates. We've done now, people have done now four different ways of estimating the number of species, and they still come to the same number roughly. Um, and the one million of threatened with extinction is probably an underestimate. There's probably even more, but we really don't have good numbers to, to, to give more accurate estimates. Uh, even though we know that the situation is dire because the International Unit for Conservation of Nature, Red List, which is the official organization that tracks the biodiversity of the world, it's called the Biodiversity Monitor of the Planet. Um, you know, the biodiversity in general is the who, where, when, like what are the species, where they are, and what what are the, the, the population trends of the species. And so, the, of the species that IUCN Red List monitors. And this is the organization that when we say the species are endangered, it's because the species commission for IUCN Red List for that species using some metrics determined that that's the, the status of the species. So they need data to do this. So more than half of the species that they track currently, and that's about 160,000, also not a big number, um, are either data deficient, so they don't have metrics enough to determine anything, or uh, the, the population trend is unknown. These are not obscure species. So killer whale, orcas, the largest dolphin in the, in, the, in the ocean, the largest dolphin in the world, killer whales, they, they're data deficient. I mean, you, if you cannot tell me anything about killer whales, I mean, they're hard to miss when they're in the ocean, right? Um, especially when they attack boats you know, in, in, in Spain. How can um, we actually but, use technology to... Exactly. Okay, there, are, there are whales, yes, and we cannot miss them when, them when we are on a ship. But like, still, how can we 
So Great question. Deficiency yeah. and the population is not known. So how can we use technology to actually measure that? That's exactly where we decided, okay, we're going to do something about it. Because, you know, polar bears, population trend is unknown. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the, the conservation icon, right, of, of the world, polar bears. So if we don't know anything about species like orcas and polar bears, we really are in, in a bad situation. So over the last 20 years, clearly technology has exploded. Uh, you know, we have remote sensing, we have autonomous drones, right, autonomous vehicles underwater on the ground and in the air. We have sensors that we can put on animals themselves, everything from radio collars to, you know, uh, Bluetooth, GPS, accelerometers, everything. We have in situ sensors such as cameras, traps that are motion activated cameras. We have acoustic sensors and we have these guys. We have devices that everybody uses to take pictures. But even with all of that, so one is by far images is the most abundant source from all of this. But two, if we look at the data of how it's distributed, it's very biased towards North America and Europe. That's not where the highest biodiversity is. Highest biodiversity is in the tropics and it's South, it's, um, South America and Africa by a large margin. And we have very little data from there. Also, all the methods for analyzing images, right? All the AI and computer vision that's being developed for image analysis. If this is what we're using as our primary source, um, again, the vast production is in North America, Europe, and China right now of these methods. That's not where the biodiversity is. So that's in, like developed in absence of the context of what's needed for these kinds of questions. And you cannot actually just take off the shelf methods that are out there for, for image analysis um, and applied directly to questions in um, biodiversity monitoring Be for many, many different reasons that I'm happy to get into in more detail. So so we need to, to, to really develop methods that are appropriate for, let's say, image analysis for biodiversity monitoring. And there is a community, not a huge community, still well under 100, if I'm being super generous, uh, that is working on developing these methods. And so methods like I mentioned, identifying individuals, so that allows us to do population counts. So Wild Book now has been used for updating whale shark, gravy zebras, thymai ring seals, and Iberian lynx population um, monitoring from directly from the data in Wildbook uh, to IUCN Red List. So the, the status also we have now, Wildbook for whales and dolphins. So hope, and, and orcas, killer whales are now part of that. So hopefully there will be soon enough data to reassess the population, the species status and to, and, and killer whales will be data deficient. How does it actually work? Like, uh... so, is there, do you use satellite data or you use some sort of like radio signals? Because like whales. Pictures. Pictures. But like so can... any kind of pictures, cameras, uh, aerial photographs, people taking pictures when they're on whale like watching, cannot... uh, fishing boats. But you cannot it's take literally the picture pictures. Ocean, no? You can take not in the entire ocean, it's still biased towards where the boats are, where the people are, right? So oh, yeah. it's where the boats are, where or or shores, where the the, the whale watching. Just maybe where are. whales try to stay away from, like there is, or maybe not. To some extent, yes. But uh, we've shown, for example, with whale sharks, which is the largest fish uh, in the ocean, that data collected by people, even though it is biased towards shores by quite a bit. Uh, data collected towards people uh, by people, including data from social media, people posting on YouTube and other social media platforms. Hey, we went on this whale watching tour, uh, on this um, whale shark, uh, swimming with whale sharks. Here's my pictures, here's my it is, uh, videos. So uh, all of these data together improved the population size estimate and was used, in fact, to uh, have the most comprehensive study 
uh, on the biology of whale sharks. It, for the first time, revealed migration patterns, seasonality of migration patterns of the species, because it, you know, people knew, but we never had enough data to show that they travel 5,000 miles. These are global species. You can identify the same whale shark in Cancun in, in, uh, and then in the Philippines. And because we can identify, yes, it's the same animal from the spot pattern of this of, of the sharks, we can now know how far they travel, what's the pattern of their travel. As a global species, there is not one project, not one organization that have data on even one individual. So you have to put together the data from the entire globe, right? To really create the picture of a, of a global species. And that's what platforms, that's what technology like this allows. We really can take all available data from the entire world. Okay. Right. So if I understood correctly, so let's say there are these whales. There is already some estimate or like I think for whales, you said it's unknown, but like for, for sharks, for certain sharks, there is already some estimate, right? And then what you can do, you can tap into social media, uh, pictures or streams from these boats or like all the signals mm -hmm. and you can use that and also knowing the patterns of how these animals travel how they migrate you can correct or make a more accurate estimate right yeah so the underlying particularly so when you can identify individuals there is a particular method statistical method that's used for population size estimates so in its capture marker capture to explain a very, very simple situation. And by the way, the same technology is used for, was used for the first ever full census of an entire species, the endangered gravy zebra or gravy zebra in uh, Kenya. So these are not, those are not the endangered ones. The ones behind me uh, are the common zebras. That's, those are the ones in Serengeti, thousands, uh, migrations with wildebeest and what most people, what most people think when they think zebra. They're not, in, they, the common ones are not endangered and they are found throughout the entire continent of Africa. There are two other species of zebras left that are, both are endangered and one of them is gravy zebra, uh, mostly found in zoos outside of Kenya and a little bit in Ethiopia. And so these are beautiful, uh, species, they look very different, smaller stripes, thinner stripes, they're bigger also, white belly and Mickey Mouse ears. And so there was estimated that there is about 3,000 of them left in the world, 95% in Kenya. And because we can identify individual animals from photographs, uh, the, the same technology enabled for the first time in 2016, the Great Gravy uh, Rally. So that was an event organized by the Gravy Zebra Cons Conservation Trust in Kenya and Kenya Wildlife, co-organized later with Kenya Wildlife Service, which is a government organization and Wildlife Direct, an anti-poaching nonprofit, to come together and to bring everybody Anybody, tourists came, uh, coming into country to, to, to on the safaris, but also Kenyans, school kids, um, the, the the park rangers, volunteers, and you know even U.S. ambassador to Kenya at the time participated. So we had about uh, uh, hundreds of people resulted in uh, for two days driving around the country, taking picture of every gravy zebra they saw and anything else they wanted, and then. In two days, that resulted in 40,000 images of zebras. So what you can do then, you can make a simple assumption that in two days, there are few, very few to none death, birth, you know, immigration, immigration of, of population. So it's a close population. And let's say on the first day, you saw uh, you saw a uh, thousand zebras. And then, so you know, you essentially, let's say you spray paint them with pink color. You shouldn't, but let's say you spray paint them. 
On the second day, you go out and you do the same thing. You try to photograph every zebra and you end up with another uh, maybe 500. But of those 500, uh, 50 are spray painted pink, right? So that what it tells you is that on any random, on any day, if you go out to see zebras, assuming that it's a close population, um, you see about 10% of the population, right, at random, because you saw on the second day, you saw 50 of the 500 were, spray, were, were marked. So, so it means that you randomly see about 10% of the population. So this, 50, so this 500 represents about 10% of the total. So your estimate should be about 5,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? so this so that's works the, for most animals, I guess, for most species, right? This but works if, if, you can cap, if you can mark them when you capture yeah. them, right? And what used to be done, it literally, people would capture animals, animals to tag them somehow. Like okay. it's often done with mice, it's often done with like small animals. And, and people or birds, they put tags, rings on birds. And so that you can do this estimate, but then it also works if you have a close population, but there are versions of this model that works for open population when you can take into account birth, death, immigration, immigration over a long period of time. The nice part about being able to recognize individual animals from photographs is that you don't have to capture them anymore. It's not invasive. You're essentially marking them by identifying. You take a picture, that's your capture. You mark them by identifying who that individual is. Not just a zebra, but that zip of the zebra, that Zoe the zebra, that that the zebra, right? And so then when you take a picture they have again. Like unique patterns or what? Yes, they have unique patterns like your fingerprint. Uh -huh. Okay. And so on the second day, when you, if somebody else takes a picture of the same zebra, we know it's the same zebra. So that's the recapture. And we knew that by the second mid morning of the second day, there were no photographs essentially of any new animals. Every zebra that was photographable that anybody saw was already photographed. So that gives you amazing confidence bounds for population size estimates. Because you know essentially that you have a photograph of every zebra that's out there that wasn't too shy to be photographed. So then the question is, how many were not seen at all? And that's where you can compare um, from 2016 to 2018, which was the same kind of event in 2020 and now 2024. And so we know that the intervening years, there were no zebras that suddenly came out of the bush to like, well, you know what? I did not want to be photographed during the, when there were too many people around, but now please do take my picture, right? So no, there were none of those. <laughs> which answers my earlier question about whales and them trying to stay away from people, mm -hmm. right? Because like, okay, the majority may, may stay away from people, but some of them do not because they're looking for food or whatever. And then like, if you measure multiple times, you can see and find a way to distinguish one um, yeah. animal from another of the same species. Yeah. I guess whales also have a way to tell that so, these two animals are different, right? Yeah, so we, we're not asking animals. We need to do it from photographs, so we need observable features. Yep. And so so for whales, we have several ways. One, uh, some whale species like uh, uh, orcas or humpback whales have distinct markings, right? So when you have a picture of the tail of an animal for humpback whales, they have black and white kind of patterns. Those are unique to every animal, individual. So you can use them like a fingerprint, the same way like we do zebras. Um, for orcas, killer whales, they have the black and white spots on them. Again, those are unique. You actually, they uniquely identify every individual in a pretty straightforward way. And many, 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 many species, if you think, have that. For whales like uh, sperm burst. whales, so, so for whale, for sperm whales, sorry, um, they don't actually have unique markings. So we use the shape of a whale's fluke, like the, the, the whale's tail. That edge of the, of the tail is a unique marking, just like your ear, by the way. The shape of your ear, that outline, is unique, and so is the elephant's ear. You can use that 
outline when it opens. I was going to ask you about paper. color bursts. Like the, there are no patterns, but he, I think you already answered that. Because like there are, maybe there are no patterns, but there are other features that we can look at. Like Face. I don't know, Face. Face. So for bears actually, and many other forward looking animals, uh, all the bear species, there's bear ID, which a Canadian couple um, started as a project, which we're starting to incorporate into wild book platforms. So bears um, and uh, cats, good dogs too, but, uh, and, and uh, like all cats, kind of cats, all the forward looking animals you can also use, and seals you can use, uh, uh, all the all the primates. We're actually working now with a group that does primate fa using facial identification. So so uh, we can start incorporating that, and then also um, uh, you know for many other species. So we have species on the platform. We have species like uh, weedy and leafy sea dragons. These are uh, Horse, uh, seahorse like uh, relatives these guys look like aliens and yet every single one is, in, is individually identifiable all turtles all eight species of turtles we have wild bug that has turtles the scale patterns on the head and on their uh, appendages are unique after about three months of age so there's so many many species that are that that are uniquely identifiable in fact you know, turns out most of us are special. Every animal is unique. Even if we humans cannot discern the 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 the, the so like I was thinking aspects. of chihuahuas. Like for me, all chihuahuas look the same, right? But uh, mm. they are probably not. It's just my like I never had a dog, right? And yeah. for me, like okay, I can tell a poodle from a chihuahua, right? But like when it comes to a specific breed, then like all of them look same to me, right? But it's because uh, it's because of me, right? Not because they are. Uh, yeah. So humans are actually biased. Yeah, mm -hmm. humans are very biased with our visual system. So there was a there was a a paper about a year and a half ago showing that humans do not have like part of it is hardware limitations in our in our visual system so we do not have for example red, enough of the red orange acuity to distinguish uh phenotype uh, different types of moths like different types of moths within one species or butterflies uh, because these differences do not actually evolve for our benefit they're for birds right mm. Moths and butterflies are signaling to birds. So when you translate the images into bird acuity uh, model, machine learning has no problem telling the differences. Humans cannot. Mm -hmm. So that's the advantage of using, uh, another advantage of using um, computational approaches is because computers can look at the world from the perspective of other species, not limited by our hardware or software for that matter. So we, even though we see the differences between the zebra patterns, and I can, and you can certainly, yeah, you I know, if you can, if you look long enough, you can, if I show you two pictures of zebras, you can tell, oh yeah, these are the same, these are not the same, after about like five minutes of looking at zebras. But if I ask you, are these two more similar to each other than these two, we have no way of quantifying even though we can see that they're different, but we can't tell how different. So that part, no amount of training. Right? Yeah, so no amount of training will let us do this because we evolved the species to be able to use faith. So we can say, oh yeah, 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 the baby looks like mom, the baby looks like dad, or this person looks like that celebrity. We're great at that. But if I tell you, you know, like is this zebra, baby zebra, like, who is its mom and dad just by stress patterns? Or like, I don't know. But computers, again, can quantify the similarity of the strike patterns, right? We have computational approaches for this, and that's the advantage. And so that is also the premise of the Imageomics Institute and the field of science Imageomics that we can extract biological information, such as traits and phenotype, the overall collection of traits 
traits that are the product of genes and the environment and the interaction of those um, directly observable ones directly from image and connect that to biological uh, function. And so, so because we can use computational approaches, right? We can use computer to complement what we're seeing right, and extend our ability to see uh, and to quantify what we're seeing from images and to see in other spectra, to see in other models, to see the world from the perspective, which is non-human, which to me, these two messages, you know, one is that we can use AI, we can use computational approaches as a partner, AI truly as a partner to humans, like to complement, not to take over, but to complement our abilities to make connections among data points, among humans, among different parts of the world, among, you know, between a, a person and nature, as well as, you know, to, to give us the ability to see what we cannot see, to see what we're missing, like that to me is, is you know, the, the, the very hopeful and, and exciting aspect of the partnership between AI and humans. Kind of back to the zebras, I'm really curious how it works. Like, let's say we have this task of telling if the, we have a zebra and we need to find the mama and the papa of the mm -hmm. zebra based on the stripe patterns. Can computers already do that? Yeah, so we can, we can we're starting to, so uh, we had a very small study, preliminary study specifically for zebras because, uh, because uh, the, the approach that we're using is actually computer for zebra identification. There's a computer vision non-AI approach at the moment. We're expanding it now to machine learning to include machine learning specifically for zebras. Uh, for other species, we do use machine learning uh, quite a bit, but here we use approach what's known as scale invariant feature transform SIFT features, which are based on the um, gradient of the pixel value difference on the sliding matrix across uh, across the, the body of the zebras. And because they have, you know, black and white patterns, so it's the gradient is is super high where that the changes are, and you can kind of create a histogram of these changes. That kind of creates a signature for each zebra, yes. right? Yes, it and creates that... a signature for each zebra, for each image, and you can match the signatures uh -huh. between... So then you any... have one like vector, another vector, and you can say yeah. how close these vectors are. And then this would give us like... The overall pattern similarity, right? Uh -huh. Right away. And like if the patterns are similar, they are probably relatives. So, so we don't know, nobody knew that. Nobody knew whether pattern, uh, stri the stripe pattern has any kind of uh, genetic component to it, whether it's heritable in any way, whether it's inherited from uh, parents to baby. But we had a small data set of pictures of moms and babies together. And we could ask, the way we could ask is, here's a picture of a baby. Who is the closest adult, most similar adult in our data set to this picture of a baby? And the mom was actually consistently in the, and it's a large population of about 3,000. So the mom was consistently in the top 10 and like quite often majority in the top three. So that's a signal that, yeah, there's, there's something there. So now we're actually collecting genetic data so we can directly correlate. We've done a similar pilot study on uh, leopards, Indian leopards, uh, and there the facial information was the most relevant. So uh, the patterns around the face. And then we also did, did a similar study on bird eggs. And so, so why bird eggs? Because birds are visual species and they recognize eggs that are theirs versus not theirs purely by sight. So people, uh, researchers have done the, the studies. Is it the shape? Is it the texture? Is it the smell? Is it anything else other than sight? And the answer is absolutely not. You can put a 3D printed egg with a pattern 
that is similar to theirs, they will accept it. And the pattern that's too far from theirs on the egg, they will kick it out of the nest. Interesting. So they're but using sight. Eggs have no patterns. They do. Oh. So so yeah. many eggs do have patterns. Uh, you're thinking chicken. Uh, this is not chicken. This is uh, other species. So um, most eggs actually have spots. Uh -huh. uh, like if so you think quail eggs, for example. No way of determining if it's. Uh, they do, they do, uh, but they they uh, they also have color. So what, like chickens that are not bred for genetic similarity, which is production production animals, very quickly start. You know, from brown, yeah. blue, brown, blue, specific, greenish. Uh, like all the chicken have the specific genome, right? Genes. Yeah, so yeah. so so they're bred. The breeds are the the, the industrial production breed. It's are very close. By the eggs are, it's like they're all siblings. Not quite, but yeah, close. And so so there's not a high diversity there in general. So they're not a good model for studying relatedness, <laughs> and uh, they're also non-parasitic. So they're not a species that need to recognize their eggs. They're in fact bred to like sit. Yeah, like the eggs are taken away from them, generally. So um, the, there, there are few ones that will kind of bring their chicks to, um, uh, to to the point where they break out of the egg. But uh, with wild species of birds, especially the ones that have like cuckoos, uh, parasitize uh, uh, other species. So they will lay eggs in other species' nests and trick uh, the host to raise them as their own. So species, so birds that have the danger, <laughs> right, of, of somebody else laying eggs in there, they, they're like, nope, no, 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 no. They learn how to differentiate, like really, and by learn evolutionarily over millions of years, they evolve to know how to recognize eggs from theirs versus not their, their nest. And oh, so, what? All the birds, apparently, because no, there are not all. The, yes, so not all the birds, not all the species. But so the question is for the species that do do that well. How do they do this, hmm. right? And if you look at this, so we worked with uh, Mark Hauber, who is a ornithologist who who specializes in um, in uh, eggs, and wrote the book literally called Eggs. <laughs> so thing, but so. Yeah. So, so there, there are pictures of, there are pictures of of uh, eggs from about eighty nests, and uh, we could not only train, not only we could train an algorithm, uh, a model, machine learning model, to differentiate between nests. We could also generate use generative AI to generate a nest, a an egg that looks like these. So we, before we get there. We also show that it correlates highly with genetic relatedness. So the eggs of the same bird, of course, are very close together in similarity. The same bird over years, you know, are also close. Uh, a, a mom and, the, and her daughter are closer than any random bird and so on. So there is a strong genetic signal. Um, there's also, we could, you know, then generate an egg that looks like an egg from the nest and 3D print it and ask a bird, would you take it, right? <laughs> and so then we can start, this is the future, we can start generating eggs gradually sort of between one and, nest and another and see at what point the bird would start rejecting the eggs, literally drawing ISO lines of sort of Pin recognition of what is still work in progress, right? You haven't. Tried. Yeah, this is work in progress. We show that there is genetic relatedness. There's strong correlation between the the genetic relatedness and the egg similarity. Something that humans cannot do without the help of a computer, right? But um, the the sort of the next step of asking the birds directly is uh, is the is the future. Is what we're, it's work in progress, but that's that's an example of where we can really, uh, you know, use machine learning, right? AI, 
um, in computational approaches to do something that humans absolutely cannot do and understand biology. I'm just curious, like why, okay, this is a very interesting experiment. We generate with AI an egg and place it, put it uh, to the nest mm -hmm. to see if the bird rejects it or not. This is, uh, this sounds like a lot of fun, but like, what are the practical implications of that experiment? Like, what does it give us knowing that, okay, the bird rejects this egg or the bird does not reject this egg? Basic understanding of the world. Of, you know, this is basic science. So understanding how skin selection, how do birds recognize, in current recognition, how do birds recognize who is theirs, who is not, in a species that we cannot at all replicate, right? We cannot do but just observation. Um, it also uh, gives us insight in general how the skin recognition works in, in, um, in nature. Do different animals use different smells? Why does it matter, right? Why do they? have that. So this is about fitness. It's about uh, uh, how we ensure that our offsprings right, survive better than somebody else's. Why would I invest any effort into raising somebody else's kids in, in, if I'm a bird? Um, and so, so this is basic science uh, to push back in a little bit that everything has to have practical implications. Because we start out with a curiosity about the world. Science, basic science, is a human endeavor of understanding the world that is out there right? by humans, for humans. A child asks, why is the sky blue? It is a basic curiosity question without worrying whether it's a chemistry question, a physics question, cognition, vision, uh, psychology, right? It is basic human curiosity that drives us to understand the world. And it doesn't worry whether you know, it's a it's it, it has some practical implications. It's the drive to know. Now, yep. having said that, yep. um, understanding how the world works, particularly how different species uh, perceive the world, how the species interaction happen, also helps us. This is the practical part. Understands what drives the loss of biodiversity and what will happen if the conditions change. What will happen if the habitats uh, are smaller? What will happen if environmental conditions change? Right. So we can start building models that predict how the species will respond. What will happen if uh, the, the, the butterflies disappear from this particular region and move a little bit north because it's warmer up there? Right. What will happen to the birds that are reliant on these butterflies right, for, for food and so on? Because, mm -hmm. like, um, I was also while you were answering, the curiosity is like a perfect uh, reason to do that. Because right now I'm super curious what actually will happen when you do that. Um, mm -hmm. But also, when thinking about the previous examples that you get, gave about um, estimating the number of zebras of a specific breed, right, of specific type, mm -hmm. or counting polar bears, or because you want to see population uh, trends, right? Is it uh, decreasing, increasing, stay same, right? And if it's decreasing, then it gives us a clear signal, okay, something needs to happen. Somehow we want to save it, right? If it's increasing, then okay, that's good. Um, and I guess this is the main uh, of what we talked about. This is the main outcome, right? So then now we have a more, uh, a better way of doing this thing, these things better mm -hmm. than did before. Do you actually collaborate with... Because um, like, okay, now you have this method. How it's being used right now? Like, are you... In extensively, contact? extensively yeah. collaborate. So it's used by hundreds of conservation organizations around the world. Wild Book has more than 70 species now. Um, and it's used by uh, by government organizations, including Kenya Wildlife Service, um, Africa Wildlife Foundation, um, the the uh, in the entirety of North American whale catalog is on the platform. So that's uh, all of the data from uh, the U.S. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency, NOAA, and Bo Boehm and NOAA. 
Um, the Canadian whale data is up there. So this is now used as the definitive source of data for many, many species. So the ability, and, and the moment you have a platform, right, that organizes your data by individual, um, for, for example, for whales, even though the platform became live in 2014, uh, agencies and, and organizations have uploaded their historic data going back to mid 90s, right? So now they can see the whole population trend and see how, start analyzing how it changes with different conditions in the area and what are the patterns of migration, as I said, and things like that. And so in combining data from different sources, because it's linked on an individual ID, right? So you can see, oh, the same whale in your data set, it's the same one in my data set right here. So look how, how she moved around. And so, and look who she's hanging out with and look at all her offspring. Oh my God, I knew that these are her three calves, but you also recorded these two are also her, her children. Great. So we now can start understanding also the genetics a little bit and, and, and which, which offspring survive and when there is a story right now with a beluga whale who died while giving birth. And like they think that the calf is also going, not going to survive. But these are, uh, you know, these are endangered species. So, so, uh, and it's like one makes a story. Now you have a more complete picture of a species with these kinds of data. And, and, and essentially it is, a, it's a data story, right? It's a story where the data is abundant and it's out there and it wasn't yet leveraged well by providing an ability to extract information from images. Not only we can now process a lot of data that's already out there, but we also, it's a, such a low barrier for entry. A three-year-old can take a picture and contribute, right? And it's like everybody can press that button or touch that screen. And so that allows contributions from people who weren't even aware they could contribute to science. The bot that we built for uh, social media when it finds, for example, uh, videos of whale sharks um, and automatically sort of adds them to, to the wild book for sharks and posts them in the comments, hey, two minutes, 46 seconds, we found this uh, video of a whale shark. Here's everything we know about it. You just contributed to conservation. People respond, people get excited. And it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. I didn't even know I could, uh, I could do this. Uh, how can I help? Right, so that immediately brings them into this connection. Right. Yeah, it's, I'm looking at the questions that Johanna has prepared, and it's a pity that uh, uh, our yeah. interview is over. Yeah, so maybe we'll get to ask you them at some um, later. Um, maybe last one before you brush into your car to watch the eclipse. Um, are there any books that talk about AI and uh, conservation and wildlife? So it's new as we started at the beginning of this, uh, really at the beginning of the the talk of the conversation. There's um, not a lot yet of AI in conservation, and in fact, and and so there are very few books uh, or written material in general. So, but recently, very recently, just published a report um, led by the Global Partnership on AI. And that's an organization that is essentially, that brings together researchers, experts in, in, in different field, fields, subfields of AI and publishes kind of a report and, and engages the global policymaking community. So. Uh, I was part of the report on AI and biodiversity. They have other AI and reports. And so that's a report that was published in November uh, 2022, 2023. Um, and uh, the, the outlines both the challenges and opportunities for AI and uh, biodiversity. And so this, I can Maybe have to share it. a link. Yeah. In the description. Yes. There is also a review of machine learning for uh, machine learning methods 
uh, for uh, conservation that's also a couple of years old. We're writing, a new, we're about to write a new one. Um, there's not that many people, as I said, of what's going out there. But uh, certainly the challenges are so urgent and so big that, you know, like, come on over everybody. Um, there's a lot, lot, lot to do. And so the, the report probably outlines uh, quite a bit of the opportunities that's in, the, that's in this area. Put the link in the description. And yeah, we should wrap up. So thanks a lot, Tanya, for joining us today, for sharing all your experience, for telling all the stories. And uh, now I also know that zebras are not horses. I had no idea. I thought it's like horses too. There are but... two, <laughs> there are two uh, species. So these guys are closer to donkeys and the endangered ones are closer to horses. <laughs> no okay, so thanks a lot. And yeah, enjoy the eclipse. Thank you. And thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to chat about AI and biodiversity and conservation. Thank you.